So you want to build a road. First is perhaps the most impossible feat, finding a route. That's because roads have a particular shape that Earth often does not. Both linearly and laterally, they're fairly flat, but not completely flat. Flat roads are dangerous. A flat turn will increase the potential of a car skidding off, so road designers slope the corners inward to counteract centripetal force and give the car more friction. The higher the speed and the sharper the turn, the more slope the turn needs, meaning there is a theoretically safest slope for a turn. The American Federal Highway Administration has a formula that converts design speed and turn radius into a suggested slope, but that's only their interpretation of it. Road designers and mathematicians endlessly shoot academic papers back and forth debating the merits of this and other super-elevation formulas. Some suggest more severe banking on turns to accommodate the higher centers of gravity of trucks. Others argue that steeper slopes are not worth the benefit due to the issues they create for slower-moving vehicles in the event of snow and ice, and it gets far more complex than that. But this is all largely irrelevant because, at the very, very most, the sideways slope will be about 12%, but it's normally quite a bit less and it's only on corners, so overall, a relatively flat cross-section is needed regardless. Linearly, in the direction of travel, even less of a slope is tolerated. In order to allow heavily loaded trucks to safely climb and descend, highways should rise or fall no more than 6 vertical feet or meters for every 100 horizontal. So, in combination, the narrow accepted range of linear and lateral slopes presents a challenge when you need a road to go over this. Colorado's Rocky Mountains. Originally, America's interstate designers didn't dare attempt to traverse these peaks. I-70 was originally supposed to end in Denver, leaving the state as the only in the region without a trans-mountain interstate. After intense lobbying, though, Washington relented. Designers would have to find a route through. The E. Lionel Pavlo Engineering Company was tasked with identifying the cheapest, flattest route through the mountains. One year later, they returned with these seven options. At first glance, the northern route seemed best, as it best subscribed to one of the most tried and tested road routing shortcuts, rivers. You see, any route through the mountains is going to require a certain amount of earthwork. If the slope is perpendicular to the road, you cut a flat section into the slope at great expense. By one estimate, a 50% slope doubles construction costs. But using Earth to achieve the required gradient in the linear direction is even more expensive, simply due to the sheer distance and volume of Earth involved. So, considering they're either going to need to flatten linearly or laterally, road builders would much rather do so laterally. The best place to find routes like this is by rivers. That's because they typically center mountain valleys and fall rather gradually. For example, the mighty Colorado River only drops about a mile of elevation across the 280 it traverses through the state, despite being surrounded by terrain steep enough for a mile of elevation gain to occur over a mile of horizontal distance. The gentle riverside linear gradient is perfect for road construction, leaving the primary gradient correction to the lateral direction, which can be done at lesser expense. Therefore, on a per-mile basis, this northern route was far cheaper and less complex. The only section that couldn't easily sit at a reasonable grade was here, traversing the Continental Divide, where they'd need to build a tunnel. But after that, the road would follow the Fraser and Colorado rivers, each shepherding a flat, mellow path through the mountains. But the Pavlo Engineering Company didn't ultimately suggest this route. Its justification was first that this northern area of Colorado was relatively sparsely populated, even by Rocky Mountain standards, meaning this route would be of lesser use to those actually living in the state rather than traversing. And perhaps more crucially, even with the relatively simple geography, it was a far longer, less direct route. This meant that, even though the southern route would require traversing two high elevation passes rather than one, Pavlo thought it could be built for some $55 million less. It would just require some creativity. Inevitably, this route too would require a tunnel. That's because it crossed the Continental Divide, the geographic split between the side of the country where rivers drain into the Atlantic and the side where they drain into the Pacific. Inherently, rivers from one side don't connect to those on the other, meaning there generally are not mellow mountain valleys for roads to follow up and across the divide. There's simply a wall of massively high, massively steep peaks, meaning traversing it was going to require either a massive feat of engineering to create an interstate standard road climbing up to nearly 12,000 feet or 3,700 meters, or the construction of the world's highest elevation road tunnel at 11,000 feet or 3,400 meters. Incredibly, given the gradients and weather in the area, the tunnel was ultimately selected as the more practical option. That left the other pass. 
The interstate was definitely going to go through Silverthorn, and it was definitely going to go through Vale, but standing between the two towns was a similarly formidable stretch of mountains. Initially, the answer was to just go straight, climb up this valley, then tunnel under Red Buffalo Pass. This would require building a similarly daunting tunnel, but it would keep the highway on its straight, efficient route through the state. The only issue was that the land surrounding this pass was part of the Forest Service's Eagle's Nest Wilderness Area, a stretch of pristine protected nature that was not supposed to be disturbed by anything. This, along with the ascent of the environmental movement more broadly, led to massive public pushback. They argued that it was bad enough for the highway to be disturbing the environmentally sensitive area at all, but for it to pass through one of the highest categories of protected land was simply untenable. As the official in charge of the Forest Service, the final call rested in the hands of Orville Freeman, the Secretary of Agriculture. In a shock decision, after alignment planning had already started on the Red Buffalo route, he said no, I-70 would have to divert elsewhere. The alternative was clear, Vail Pass. With its more manageable gradients and comparatively lower 10,600-foot, 3,200-meter elevation, this route could actually be navigated without a tunnel. The downside was that the 10 miles or 16 kilometers in added length would lead to an estimated 94 cents in additional fuel and maintenance cost for every driver. But at least, after years of debate, study, surveying, and consensus building, finally, Colorado's Trans Mountain Interstate had a route. Now, they just needed to turn it into reality. Up to this point, much of the work had been done from top down. When it's time to build, though, this orientation flips as road construction happens one layer at a time from the bottom up. Vail Pass is undeniably steep, but by Rocky Mountain standards, not impossibly steep. In fact, while the section from Vail to Vail Pass reaches a grade over the preferred range of 0 to 6%, the pass averages roughly a Colorado comfortable 4.5% grade. Linear grade, in other words, was a challenge, but the lateral would prove an even bigger headache. To transform undulating, unruly topography into a uniform transportation throughway, planners start by turning in their overhead projections for a map of a different sort, a side cut. Now it's time to create a path flat enough and wide enough for a road. This starts with building a road base which, in turn, requires the earth-moving processes of cutting and filling. Processes straightforward enough that their name does most of the explaining. Fill earth where it's needed, and cut away where it isn't. At its simplest, cutting and filling begins first with surveying in the field, then with measurements made, moves to paper, becoming an exercise in rudimentary math. First, the proposed route is broken into 100-foot or 30-meter sections called stations. Then, at each station or half-station, planners look at the side cut and figure out where dirt needs to be added and where it needs to be removed. If a road's going into a hillside, for instance, the cut will be on the uphill side, the fill on the downhill side, with the earth from the cut being moved to the fill. On flat land, there's likely to be more fill than cut, as a road will be positioned to sit higher than its surroundings so water will shed off the road's shoulder rather than pool. Once the amount of earth required to move is figured out at one particular station, it's on to the next station to do the same math, then the next, then the next after that. And once all these values are figured out, the planner now has a rough sense as to how much earth will need to be moved and how much time, material, and money it will cost across the entire length of the roadway. According to a Florida Department of Transportation cost-estimating model, this part of the process, cutting and filling or excavating and embanking for a divided four-lane highway across a rural landscape, would cost in itself over $1 million a mile, which makes up nearly a quarter of the per-mile price. Though a task that's easy to wrap one's head around, it's one that requires a fundamental reshaping of a landscape, and thus, a lot of money. And this estimates for the flat state of Florida, not Colorado a state where protruding peaks and a rocky disposition make it easy for earth-moving costs to shoot a mile high. Before I-70 crested over Vail Pass, it was US Highway 6, a small two-lane road cut into the north side of the canyon that was notorious for its sharp turns and difficult driving. It was dangerous to the point that motorists often avoided it, opting for the smoother, safer, but exceptionally indirect US 40. To build a bigger road, effectively two US 6s, while making the road safe enough to move unfamiliar Americans across at a 60 mile per hour clip, there would need to be a lot more earthwork. But in such a tight space, in such a pristine and delicate environment, there would also be major constraints. The first was this tiny creek. While a waterway that only a fraction of Coloradans can actually name, Black Gore Creek was and is critical to the communities below, filling the recreational reservoirs near the pass, supplying drinking water to Vail, and eventually dedicating its flow to a section of creek below the town of Vail that's earned the distinction as a gold medal water for trout fishing. 
Black Gore Creek is important. Locals knew as much and federal planners knew as much. So when it came to figure out where to flatten out enough space for a road base, the question of what it would do to the watershed became an important one. Runoff is a tricky business in road building. It first presents a challenge during construction, but handled improperly will remain a challenge for the lifespan of a road. On Vail Pass, this challenge was exacerbated by perpetually sandy soils, rapid snowmelt in late spring, and pounding rainfall in midsummer. With the passage of the National Environmental Policy Act of 1970, I-70 contractors were just beginning to understand environmental impact statements and pollution laws when they were awarded contracts to get the interstate over the mountain. Now, rather than just being fast, they had to be diligent too, or face the fines. City officials downstream from the project, for their part, were concerned about construction, as the loose soil at the pass was already silting up the town's water supply before any construction tore out grass and vegetation upslope. So contractors, as they do today, meticulously tested the water to ensure that sediment hadn't risen to unacceptable levels under their watch. To keep these levels low during construction, teams placed hay bales and sandbags to slow runoff and direct it to settlement basins. Water would inevitably make it to the stream, but if they slowed it and let the particles settle to the bottom, it wouldn't carry too much dirt down with it. But these are temporary problems with temporary fixes. There's also the challenge of dealing with water once a road's complete, and this is such a critical concern of road building that the US Department of Transportation Project Development and Design Manual dedicates an entire chapter to the subject of water. Basically, the question this entire chapter revolves around is how to best move water around and off roadways without ruining the nearby surroundings. The answer begins above the cut and starts during the construction phase. The very moment a road base is established, it's a race to revegetate the slope above the road with grasses and shrubbery that will hold the land in place when it rains. Generally, planners look to keep the uphill slope no steeper than a ratio of 2 to 1. For every 2 units the slope extends horizontally, it may safely rise 1. With a harsher environment, Vail Pass planners opted for slopes of 2.5 to 1 or less, and to give grasses their best chance, sprayed hillsides with mulch on the steepest sections, and placed netting to help the seed take hold. For natural depressions that served as drainages for the hillsides, teams placed thirsty willows and boulders to both naturalize the landscape and slow the flow. On Vail Pass, and generally in highway construction, builders will make the most of these perpendicular drainages and actually cut uphill ditches running parallel with the road to divert runoff headed for highway to the drainage, then below via culvert. Where applicable, paralleling ditches, culverts, and revegetation have proved tried and true techniques to manage runoff and mitigate erosion in Colorado and elsewhere. But in the narrow confines below the pass, neither simple cut and fills nor their drainage systems were always applicable. To ensure that road fill wouldn't spill into Black Gore or Ten Mile Creek, planners instead opted for retaining walls. Where rock formations made a smooth 2 to 1 cut impossible, explosives blasted sheer walls out of troublesome rock formations while netting and planted topsoil placed above mitigated future rockfall. And most unique to this particular section of interstate are the sections neither blown into the rock nor cut into the mountainside, but the 23 separate sections of the interstate that float across the landscape on bridges that were placed to account for the fact that almost the entire road from Vail to the pass sits on a fault line and a series of still-shifting historical landslides. With the cuts and fills, the exposed rock cuts, and the bridges, this section of roadway is practically a highway building handbook on its own, and as an exemplary road of nearly every trick and technique available to road engineers, it wasn't cheap. When Vail Pass was proudly dedicated in 1978, estimates put the cost of the 24-mile, 39-kilometer section at an estimated $91 million. Adjusted for inflation, that's nearly $427 million total, $18 million per mile, or $11 million per kilometer. And yet, with all that money spent, driving over Vail Pass doesn't feel as if you're passing over an engineering marvel that's conquered a landscape, but rather a road that almost seems a part of it. With a delicate landscape front of mind, while crossing forest service land and connecting ski resorts and a host of other recreation hotspots, every last detail along the pass, from the red-tinged concrete to match the local rock, boulders strewn across revegetation areas, and Frank Lloyd Wright-inspired retaining walls to the manner in which rock was blasted to make it look more natural, the section of interstate was built to fit the landscape and the values of the area around it, something that's not lost on contemporary planners who have carefully codified these specific design traits for future additions or alterations on the pass. In this way, though, I-70 is the same as any other road, designed uniquely to fit its environment and best serve a particular purpose. But even once designed and built for that environment, the environment is constantly shifting, which means that roads, especially those as complex as I-70, need constant management in order to stay safe. 
With its tight turns, steep gradients, and volatile weather, the entirety of this road is treacherous, but with their inherently limited resources, the Colorado Department of Transportation focuses its efforts most on the sections that are most dangerous and most disruptive to close down. Eisenhower Tunnel, that highest road tunnel in the US, is one such spot. Even under the best conditions, the slower speeds of the tunnel turn it into a choke point that causes massive, notorious traffic backlogs. If the tunnel closes, an entire interstate's worth of traffic must divert onto the winding, treacherous two-lane Loveland Pass, which turns a bad traffic situation catastrophic. But there simply are not alternatives. The next shortest diversion is two hours long over another treacherous mountain pass, so CDOT does everything possible to keep Eisenhower Tunnel open. This starts with some controversial rules. Hazmat trucks, carrying fuel, chemicals, or other hazardous materials, are not allowed through the tunnel. The logic is that a fuel tanker fire, for instance, would be absolutely catastrophic in such an enclosed space. While the tunnel does have its own fire department that can handle smaller incidents, its remote location means that getting full resources to combat such a hazmat incident could take hours, in which time the tunnel could be damaged to an extent that could take months or years to fix, let alone the risks to any drivers trapped inside. What this means is that hazmat trucks must take the treacherous Loveland Pass instead, which CDOT plows up to its near 12,000-foot, 3,700-meter peak all through the winter, making it Colorado's highest year-round road. Of course, navigating a fuel tanker up a steep, winding road to 12,000 feet in the middle of a Colorado winter is far from safe, so trucking industry advocates argue that this policy is effectively trading the safety of truck drivers for the convenience of ski commuters, but after a recent feasibility study reevaluating the policy, CDOT maintains that it's the best balance of safety overall. But even I-70 itself is plenty treacherous in the winter. After all, this is the highest elevation section of interstate in the US. Given their proximity to the Continental Divide, both sides of the tunnel are flanked by steep mountain faces, and with steep mountain faces come avalanches. This is Mount Bethel, and these two tree-free corridors are the telltale signs of an avalanche path. If an avalanche were to trigger without warning, the snow and debris could bury the roadway for hours or even days, and potentially even bury people. Therefore, CDOT triggers avalanches themselves. At the start of each winter, the department positions Obelix trigger devices at the top of slide paths on each side of the tunnel. These remotely triggered egg-shaped capsules shoot out a concussive blast from the bottom that, if the conditions are right, trigger an avalanche in the snow below. This allows CDOT to close the interstate during a low traffic period to assure nobody gets caught up, and trigger avalanches regularly enough that no single slide will catastrophically bury the roadway. But especially in a landscape like Colorado's, the priority list of road safety issues is constantly shifting, meaning CDOT has to adapt. In recent years, Glenwood Canyon, 80 minutes to the west, has become the interstate's new most sensitive section. It follows the Colorado River through a deep canyon with thousand-foot walls, and in the event of a closure, there is simply no viable diversion route. What normally takes 30 minutes turns into a four-hour trek across rural two-lane roads, effectively cutting off the entire western slope from Denver. But in 2020, the road was shut for 13 days as a wildfire swept through the canyon, and even that was the least of its issues. As the fire burned the plant life whose roots kept soil in place, rainstorms cascaded into massive mudslides that would bury the road, and potentially, drivers. Unlike avalanches, mudslides can't be remotely triggered during a managed closure, forcing CDOT to rather close the highway whenever heavy rain was forecasted, bifurcating the state just by the threat of weather. With shifting threats and ever-changing demand, managing a road like I-70 is an endless job. CDOT and its personnel constantly face new challenges to keep this crucial conduit flowing. After all, it's a road whose existence was once thought impossible, but considering its impossible existence has transformed the entire state's economy and human geography, its operation is now just simply crucial. With decades having now passed since I-70's original construction, it's due for upgrades, and plenty are happening right now thanks to funding from the $1 trillion federal infrastructure package passed two years ago. Now, this was something where congressional and public opinion was split evenly down party lines, and the media coverage about the passing of the bill often framed the issue in terms of who's winning and losing politically. That's why I've been using our sponsor Ground News to research issues in a way that lets me see past this partisan spin. It's a website and app developed by a former NASA engineer on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven way to read the news. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, factuality, and ownership of the sources reporting. 
all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. And you can directly compare related articles from different sources to see what details are emphasized, or exaggerated, or left out. I especially like the blind spot feed, which highlights stories that are disproportionately covered by one side of the political spectrum. Now, you may be thinking, why should I pay attention to partisan sources? But if you lean right, you may have missed this story, and if you lean left, you may have missed this story. I think it's important we understand how our current media environment operates and the impact it might have on our politics so we can engage in constructive dialogue and maybe we can even challenge some of our own assumptions. You can go to ground.news slash Wendover to get 30% off the Ground News Vantage plan, which includes a feature called My News Bias. It's basically a dashboard for your news diet, showing you what your top news sources are, whether you engage with different perspectives, what topics you're interested in, and a lot more. Go to ground.news slash Wendover or click the link in the description to see how your reading habits change over the next month and support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent.